be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending upon where you're signing in from. Welcome to the Lung Cancer Living Room. Um, as most of you watching um, know, I'm Danielle Hicks. Uh, I oversee patient support services for GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer, and we are thrilled to have you. Uh, this afternoon, um, we have our guest speaker, Joelle Fati, who is going to be talking to us about telehealth, what you guys need to know now. We're going to talk a little bit about where telehealth has been, um, how it's sort of adapting during the COVID crisis. And then a little bit at the end, we're gonna talk about what we think needs to happen in the future. Not only does Joelle uh, serve on the GoTo Foundation Scientific Leadership Board, she's also on the National Lung Cancer Roundtable Steering Committee. Uh, she's an adult primary care nurse practitioner, certified tobacco treatment specialist, and dedicated the majority of her clinical career to oncology. Uh, including integral roles in thoracic surgery, pulmonary medicine, and lung cancer screening. So not only is she, not only is she an expert in, uh, in this telehealth space, but lung cancer is clearly uh, one of her passions. She's the clinical associate professor in the Department of Biobehavioral Nursing and Health Informatics at the University of Washington School of Nursing. And she spent over 20 years providing direct patient care and services at local, national, and global levels as an expert and advocate in tobacco control. So welcome, Joelle, thanks for coming today. Thank you. As you guys know, um, we've adapted our lung cancer living room uh, into a re rapid response living room where we'll be bringing to you uh, weekly updates on different topics in particular right now as they pertain to you your health um, uh, in this time of COVID-19. So we're gonna start with a basic question, Joelle, and just ask um, what is telehealth and which members of the healthcare team can provide this type of service? You know, telehealth has really been around for a very, very long time. It dates back to the early 1900s and um, the concept uh, really started translating across telephone lines, so telephonic uh, connectivity. And this day and age, with sort of our acclimation to audio video conferencing, we often skip right to uh, the idea when we hear telehealth um, in regards to seeing each other over uh, live video. But um, really, historically, it started telephonically. And I always like to remind people that I don't want to forget the value of connecting with people by telephone because there's still a lot of really important work. And we've seen that during the COVID-19 um, setting. Critical services that have been from a healthcare standpoint and many other um, critical services in our communities that have been provided by telephone. So telehealth really starts with uh, telephonic uh, connection to anybody. And, um, and it's a very reliable uh, source of uh, that connectivity. You know, there's been a real emphasis in the last uh, 10 to 15 years on finding ways to uh, connect with our patients by uh, live audio video conferencing. And uh, in the telehealth world, we call that synchronous and we define it um, uh, in relationship to asynchronous uh, connections. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but this audio video conferencing, the live connectivity traditionally in healthcare has been, has really only made this sort of uh, emergence as a, 
a feasible and realistic way to connect with our patients in the last five to 10 years. I used to run telehealth clinics and I loved them. I loved them for uh, a number of reasons, but the main reason is because it's a modality of care that allows us to instantaneously reach people, providing they have the equipment or the uh, technology on their end, but we can beam each other up in a very short period of time and provide re you know resources and services that can be very critical for people in need. And I can give you some examples um, a little bit later. Telehealth by audio video conferencing, real time looking and, and seeing each other and being able to speak. Now, there are other services that are really important to consider and often sort of in the background that we don't know um, are available and have become equally important during this um, period of time where we've had, uh, you know, a, a a national and international emergency. And um, asynchronous can be just as important in connecting with people, including shooting films. So let's say chest X-rays or chest CT imaging, really kind of beaming them electronically real time, but uh, in an asynchronous fashion, we could have a provider like a radiologist looking at those images uh, at another time. That could also be considered a uh, store and forward where we're able to provide a service where any kind of clinician or person um, who is helping patients is able to review data uh, that could be even remote monitoring. So uh, people's oxygenation levels, their heart monitor, um, EKG, rhythm strips, et cetera. So there's synchronous, there's asynchronous, there's telephonic. And then there's also patient portals, which uh, is an extension of this technology that has been around for quite some time, but I think also equally important to touch on during this great time of need in this country, because there's been a real push of patient care to our patient portals and how we would define as patient portals is usually through the electronic health record when you are a patient within a health system that you can communicate again in an asynchronous fashion. It's not real time, but you can leave a message for your providers or the the individuals, often nurses who are picking up messages at that uh, patient portal within the electronic health record and get an answer back. Um, but increasingly right now in this time of need, this country has been relying much more heavily on the patient portal to provide critical services as our healthcare providers have been on the front lines delivering uh, direct care real time. So I want to step back. Sorry, I'm taking some notes here for a second in, in some of the different modalities that we talked about or that you talked about, you brought up the telephonic as the first sort of example. How is that being used today in real time outside of, you know, I remember back in the day when my kids were little and somebody spiked a fever after hours and I would call the doctor's office and the answering service would call the on-call doc and somebody would call me back. Is that what we're talking about when we talk about telephone? Yeah, um, that's uh, an excellent example. You know, I would say also in my clinical practice in lung cancer, lung cancer screening and tobacco um, cessation services, you know, there's often opportunities where we've met in person, we've had a consultation, uh, whether it be in the synchronous setting by audio video conferencing or in person in a clinic. Um, but out here in Washington State, where I'm located, we service uh, a very broad geographic uh, area, including other states like Alaska, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming. And so it's not always realistic to have patients um, in person. And there are often clinical services that we can provide that don't really require seeing each other um, in person or by audio video. We can instruct people or um, provide them with patient education or check-ins um, to understand how a treatment is going, um, what side effects they might be experiencing. And, you know, we've really kind of gotten into this rhythm of, nope, we've got to see patients. And I think we really, um, you know, in, in a good way in this country, we've been really kind of placing an emphasis even before COVID-19 um, in thinking about what is right for the patient and how do we drive um, quality care and what does quality care look like? And there are many ways to define quality care, but 
one of the one of the ways that I would define that, and I think many share this view, is um, frequent connection with people so that we can understand what their experience is and how they're responding to interventions, treatments, how their um, clinical course is going. So, you know, it doesn't really always, uh, often, it doesn't mean that we have to be connecting by looking into each other's eyes. Um, we can do so much of that on the telephone. And uh, I think it's really kind of driving us back to some of the basics of, you know, simplicity. It's just connecting with people and hearing their story and asking the right questions. And in healthcare, when we learn how to diagnose and treat patients, um, you know, we, we learn that 90% of a diagnosis comes from the history, just talking to the patient. And now after 25 years of direct clinical care with patients, I have to tell you, there's so much truth in that. If you're a savvy healthcare provider um, and you know the right questions and you understand um, the course of um, therapeutic treatment or whatever it is that um, the patient has been prescribed, you can really connect with people by telephone. And this is where I would imagine that store and send sort of aspect of what we're talking about comes into play, where your healthcare professional that you have set up some sort of a telehealth appointment with can have access to films if they need it, whether it be x-rays, CT scans, any electronic medical records that show that type of history so that the healthcare professional is prepared for that appointment, um, whether it's in a room or on a, on a conference call or something like this. Yeah, and I can give you a nice example. In the telelung program that I uh, was involved in, I saw patients who had a history of lung cancer, either who had recently had thoracic surgery or were uh, currently undergoing medical treatment for their cancer um, or in lung cancer screening. And in any of these settings, I was seeing people in follow-up or for initial consultation. Often all of these uh, areas of of care uh, involve imaging. And so the patients could get their films um, done locally in their community. Uh, in my setting, uh, these people live remote on the Olympic Peninsula. So a pretty long drive and ferry ride and trip into the city. Um, but really, I, as a healthcare provider, had access to those films. So really, almost instantaneously within 20 to 30 minutes of those films being um, shot in the radiology department, I could access those films. So that's a that's an example of storing forward. And then um, by the patient, by the my patient could be in the radiology department, go straight to the doctor's office uh, where they would check in and connect with me by audio video conferencing. And I could pull up their films real time and share those films on the screen with them. So we could look at that imaging together and talk about those results and the implications of those results uh, as it related to their current state and clinical care plan. That's really interesting. And, and I don't want to jump too far ahead in the conversation, but how does that work similarly between healthcare professionals in a, in a Project ECHO type of environment? Sure. So Project ECHO is, um, is a really great concept that was born out of the University of New Mexico quite a long time ago now, probably at least a decade ago. And the spirit of Project ECHO is really to help develop healthcare providers in remote areas to provide specialty care to patients who live out there. The reason why Project ECHO and this concept is so invaluable is that when we have patients that are in remote areas, and remote can be even 20 miles away, but often it's much further than that. Often there are healthcare providers that are also out there, but there's a shortage of healthcare providers in remote areas. And often they are primary care providers who are really trained as the jack of all trades. They know something about everything, but they don't have deep knowledge in very specific areas. And so when we talk about quality of care, it's really important that, that we provide care that is effective, that it is efficient, that it's timely, and it gets the patient the care that they need as soon as possible. So when you meet with other providers in, in, by audio video conferencing, by this concept, uh, Project ECHO, it means that experts at a larger healthcare center, say in Seattle, Washington, and providers in these remote areas are coming together 
and exchanging expertise, often those remote providers have the opportunity to come forward with clinical cases. They can share um, patient uh, cases to get um, expert uh, input on how to manage those cases, but it's often an educational experience as well where the providers educate the providers in the remote areas so that they can develop a cadre of expertise and tools to help the patients in those remote areas. And Store and Forward is an extension of this where we would call it in healthcare e-consults where uh, Dr. Danielle Hicks could uh, send uh, a picture to Joel Fati in Seattle of a rash after a chemotherapy um, infusion and say, I'm not really sure what this is. This is what we've treated it for. This is what it looks like. Here's a picture of it. And then get um, hopefully a very quick turnaround uh, from the expert dermatologist in Seattle who has volumes of experience seeing drug reactions, for example. So getting some expert help in that e-consult um, store and forward space. I, th I, I love these stories and I love how some of the examples you've given um, in particular, how it directly can relate back to the patient and the provider and all of it sort of working together really points back to all of this can happen. And the rash was a perfect example. We know a lot of patients, particularly on targeted therapy, suffer from um, these rashes. So rather than, particularly if you're in a rural area, having to drive into town for someone to look at your rash to be able to send forward some sort of photo, in, not only just in between the doctors, but for the doctor and the patient to have a look-see on something like this, right? I, I would imagine that eases a lot of stress in the mind of uh, patients and physicians really everywhere. What about mobile health? Um, what role do some of the, um, some of those, whether it be a mobile application or a wearable, what role do those things play? So there's a, a little bit of terminology that's helpful here. So when we talk about synchronous, um, real-time uh, visits over audio video conferencing, um, we really kind of refer that, to that as, as uh, telehealth as sort of an umbrella term. But traditionally, telehealth was offered in clinics, kind of clinic to clinic. So in my telehealth clinics, I was in a clinic in Seattle and I had patients checking into a clinic in, um, in a remote uh, little town on the Olympic Peninsula. Now in the telehealth world, we uh, may, you may hear the terminology M health or virtual health. And what that um, often means is that it's um, a healthcare provider connecting with a patient who is on a device. So that could be a tablet, an iPad, and um, or an iPhone, for example. And then there's also remote monitoring. So, you know, we have lots of patients in this country who are experiencing all kinds of different cl underlying clinical conditions. And that could be people who have sleep apnea or lung disease or heart failure, or even uh, experiencing some symptoms with their um, underlying oncology issues. And all of these areas, uh, all these settings, these clinical settings that I just um, shared with you, healthcare providers could really help the patients more if we understood uh, how their symptoms were going and certain physical, if we had more data, more knowledge about uh, their clinical conditions. So in the setting of someone with heart failure, it's helpful to know how it, what is their blood pressure? How are they oxygenating? What is their weight today? Are they gaining fluid that could be evidence that their heart is um, out of balance with their medications um, or something needs to be adjusted with their diet? And so this is all data that can be collected by patients at home and remotely um, sent to a provider's office or you know, um, to a data bank that could be monitored by a number of different types of healthcare professionals. Um, and that's almost real time, right? So Danielle Hicks can get up this morning, she can weigh herself, she can check her blood pressure and her heart rate, and she can ship that data with a touch of a finger off to um, healthcare providers who are have set up their systems, their workflows to be on alert for those and respond to those um, to that data. In oncology, some oftentimes that's um, symptom management for people who are undergoing current therapy. Uh, and the data can be sent real time and monitored real time and responded to in an efficient way 
rather than patients declining at home, um, trying to manage symptoms, and then, you know, coming in um, when they're sick. And, uh, and sometimes it's, it, you know, it's, we're picking things up later than we should be. What if their regular healthcare provider, primary care physician, uh, for instance, is hesitant to use telehealth? What might a patient do to help encourage them to adopt it? I'll tell you, that's a really tough one. Um, it's tough because historically there's been a lot of hesitancy in this country to adopt telehealth for a couple of reasons. And some of those reasons may not be clearly evident to, um, to the patient, for example. So um, some of the hesitancy might be because this um, primary care provider, for example, isn't uh, comfortable with technology. And, um, and that's, uh, that has been a big uh, challenge. And we've seen it even during COVID-19, the response um, that we've had to take to um, keep patients safe, keep them in their homes and, and take care of them and meet their clinical needs at home. Um, so this has been a real you know, struggle for some healthcare providers. So we just have to be really honest. Generationally, and I, I have to say, I'm right on the cusp. Like I, I remember when the first Apple computer came out, it wasn't that long ago, but for our younger population of people who are, you know, who are very technologically savvy, it, um, it is a real challenge. Although I have to say that technology has gotten much better and easier and user-friendly on both ends. So encouraging providers to or reaching out to the office manager and saying, hey, you know, I'd really like to have telehealth as an option. Are there any providers here that provide that service? Can I access your clinic in, in other ways? You know, honestly, uh, there are so many different um, platforms now that they have just made it so streamlined. It's so different even when I started telehealth clinics in 2013. And the quality of the connection is so much better. The other thing is that we've had some limitations in this country that are not apparent to patients, and that is reimbursement and licensure for um, providers to be delivering telehealth services. So some of the limitations, for example, I'll keep uh, drawing back on my example in Seattle is that we were seeing a lot of patients from this Olympic Peninsula. Now the Olympic Peninsula is actually very big, but there's only one little slice of the peninsula that is actually designated by the government as a health professional shortage area. And that traditionally has been the limitation that we could only provide healthcare services and being reimbursed for those services if we were providing them in a designated HPSA rural area. So um, a lot of, you know, clinical settings, health systems, and doctor's offices have been interested in getting into the telehealth space. They know that it's the right thing for their patients, but they also understand that it is not historically been financially feasible to run a business and seeing patients by telehealth because at the end of the day, time represents money and valuable resources in that healthcare delivery model. And um, we just haven't been able to find the reimbursement um, policies on a local and national level that facilitate providers to openly be providing um, services by telehealth. Uh, and then there's the licensing issue. Um, you know, depending on where you're located, there's actually local policies that limit who you can see and where, um, and uh, limitations around seeing patients across state lines, uh, depending on how you're licensed and where you're licensed. So since we're talking about this regulatory stuff right now, how is it changing or shifting in sort of the days of COVID in order to react to, is it changing or shifting at all right now? Yeah. Well, thank you for asking that. So let's just back up kind of pre-COVID, I'll say. So for example, at the national level, at that federal level, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services who really drive um, Medicare coverage, which you know uh, represents a, a rather large portion of our population in America, those 
rules around how we can administer um, telehealth services have been pretty clamped down. They've been pretty locked down. So for example, before COVID, we were not allowed, we were not at reimbursed to provide services to patients unless they were in a designated health professional shortage area or a very, very specific um, medical setting within a medical office. Now, post-COVID or intra-COVID, if you will, um, there have been some relaxation of rules. Now, I think, I think many of us understand that this may be these may be temporary relaxation of rules, but one of the rules that has been relaxed is that as healthcare providers, we're allowed to see patients um, in their residences by um, mobile health, M Health, uh, where I could be here in my home and I could be beaming Danielle Hicks up on her um, iPhone at her house and helping her manage her symptoms. Um, and there's been some uh, rural relaxation around home visits and getting people their um, chemotherapeutic agent infusions at home, which is really great. So we can prevent interruption in healthcare delivery and important uh, treatments, but we can also continue to connect with people. This makes so much sense. And, and, and I worry that we're going to revert back to uh, where we were before COVID. Um, but but it's also an extremely exciting time because we're really providing a proof of concept in this country that it can be done. And um, if there's any silver lining from a telehealth perspective and what we're experiencing in this terrible crisis in this country is that um, it's really kind of pulled the bandaid off with telehealth. And we're um, historically, payers, um, uh, insurance companies didn't want to pay for telehealth services. And, and largely the, the concern is that the quality of care might be different, that services may not be provided to the standard of care that we would hope for or expect in person. And I think what we're going to be able to see is that um, the standard of care has definitely been met. We're going to have data. We're going to be able to look back and use this information. And we're going to have so many case reports and opportunities to see indeed that we can care for people, we can provide standard of care. And in many cases, we may actually be providing better care and care that is actually less costly. So I talked about the reimbursement um, for services that are provided in the home. There's been some relaxation in the licensure and licensed independent practitioners like myself. So doctors, nurse uh, practitioners, physician assistants providing healthcare services across state lines. Now, there have also been um, rules, historical rules in other states that have said, I'll use Alaska as an example, who have um, a rule that says that I can't see patients in Alaska from Washington unless I've established care with that patient face-to-face -face in my office that has an Alaska address. So that instantly <clears throat> um, uh, determines that I, even if Danielle Hicks comes to Seattle and has a surgery with me and goes back home, I can't really legitimately provide her services unless I have an office in Alaska and we met in person. So there are rules in this um, country that have been relaxed in regards to that. Um, and, and that means that no prior existing relationship in person needed to be established, and I don't necessarily need to have a practice in Alaska. So you can see how advantageous that could be um, for various reasons across the care continuum um, within the space of lung cancer screening, um, diagnosis of lung cancer, depending on what diagnostic services you need, treatment of lung cancer, uh, including surgical um, interventions and medical oncology and uh, and beyond. So with some of the relaxing that's happening right now uh, around a couple of things that you mentioned, is that just for Medicare, Medicaid patients? I know we, t we touched a little bit on the private payer. How much influence does CMS have on the private payer yeah. to, to come back and, and do the same? Yeah, great question. So private payers and um, state Medicaid health plans definitely look to CMS for what 
um, provision CMS brings forward and what they're reimbursing for. But CMS is really administered from the government's uh, uh, national level. Um, Medicaid is administered state by state and um, private payers are often national companies, but they administer their health plan state by state as well. And the uh, Medicaid health plans and the private uh, health insurance plans um, can actually strike contracts with different health systems and providers at different rates, but they really have jurisdiction over their own rules and regs. Uh, largely. And so what happens at the CMS level within Medicare doesn't always translate to what's happening at a local level in each of our states, um, particularly as it relates to our Medicaid health plan and our private um, uh, insurers. So that's one of the challenges in this country is that we have um, different payers with different uh, rules and regulations and no consistency across the board. And so you can imagine as a provider, um, uh, you have to keep track of many different, you have to keep track of the landscape of all of the payers that your, insur your um, patients are insured by um, to understand, well, in this setting, we can do this with this payer, we can do this um, and what the limitations are. So I can tell you that in Washington state, we've seen a lot of um, really great partnership, uh, for example, at the Medicaid health plan where um, the Medicaid, um, the state Medicaid, um, our healthcare authority who really kind of administers the state Medicaid uh, rules and regs, they've really stepped forward. They've mapped telephonic um, reimbursement to real time in-person uh, reimbursement rates. Um, they've really accommodated um, uh, reimbursement for telehealth visits. Um, it, it's just been really encouraging. And I think it's been great to see what, uh, when in a time of need, what we're capable of. And I really hope that there's some muscle memory that occurs there because historically we haven't had a lot of movement. And, you know, in Washington State, we've been writing legislation to really move the needle in telehealth. And it's been very, very difficult to get that legislation through. Can you talk a little bit about the, because of these inconsistencies, um, the barriers that they, um, that they create, particularly around how um, it influences disparities. I'll use the example of my telehealth clinics. As the crow flies, the telehealth clinics that I was servicing um, from my home base in Seattle, it's probably about 70 to 100 miles away, but it's truly round trip about um, a 10 hour round trip with driving single lane highways and taking ferries, traveling the water, coming into the city. And if you take a look at the population alone, the population out there is a, a very poor population of people, a much more diverse population. In King County, where I live in Seattle, the smoking rate, the prevalence is around 14%. And out there, it's closer to 30%. So we have a high concentration of uh, people who are at very uh, increased risk for tobacco-related diseases. So we have people who don't have the resources to be mobile and come into the city. We have people who um, are elderly and can't get the resources they need. So, you know, you can see right there how without telehealth, these people are terrifically isolated um, without many different types of resources. And when I think about telehealth, you know, I think um, the benefits of other resources like financial counselors, social workers, um, psych mental health, uh, you know, Telehealth opens up this opportunity to really um, get a cadre of services out to people that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So it's it's really an exciting time, but it it really kind of demonstrates how we can address these health disparities and health inequities that are you know really um, pinnacle in and and the primary drivers in the poor health outcomes, the poor health and the poor. Th health outcomes that we see in our populations, particularly for people who are remote. But we also see that in the city, by the way. Even in urban areas, we have pockets of people who are suffering um, great health disparities. And we can be using telehealth to remedy that as well. In a perfect world where all of the stars are aligning and telehealth 
is accessible, you know, to everyone. How are the decisions made um, around the modality? Is that a shared decision making between the patient and their healthcare provider? Is it the healthcare provider? What is what is a what does good look like when something like that gets pulled together? Yeah, so, you know, this is something that I really hope gets better with time here, especially since um, a lot of people in health systems and providers have been just sort of chucked right into the middle of telehealth, but hopefully it's really kind of demystified many things and it's created this um, opportunity for envisioning how things really could be and how we can transform our practices, our practice models to really um, benefit the patient and fit in, and in some ways really benefit us as, as healthcare providers in terms of the types of visits that we're doing and, and what is the best fit. You know, in the perfect world, uh, we would really be sitting down and looking at, um, okay, realistically, if it's a sure decision-making visit, does the patient really need to come in for that? Do, do we really need to see each other face-to-face -face in person for that? Probably not. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, in the spirit of lung cancer screening, for example. So, you know, in the real world, I'd have a patient come into the clinic, whether it was by telehealth or in person, we would have the shared decision making. And then on a different day, if they decided to move forward in the process, they would go get their screening. And in my case, I actually saw them back to review their results. But, you know, by the letter of the law, that shared decision-making visit needs to occur in person. And if my patient remotely wasn't in a health professional shortage area, I couldn't provide those services by telehealth. But it's silly if Danielle lives down the street, let's say she's caring for her elderly husband who um, she needs to be around. She has to hire someone to get to to be able to go out, why couldn't we do that shared decision-making? Why would we allow that to be a barrier? Why not use telehealth? I gotta say, I think probably at least 50 to 70% of the work that we do could be provided by telehealth. I'll give you another example. Um, a lot of work that I've done has been in tobacco cessation. I really prefer to have an in-person initial consult to really connect and develop trust and make a plan and for that person to really understand who I am and what my approach is and helping them quit smoking. Um, but honestly, a majority of the follow-up work does not have to happen in person. And sometimes that follow-up is a quick telephone chat. It's, it's a 10 minute, hey, did you get your medicine? You're doing okay, how's your withdrawal? And other weeks, it might be a 60 minute visit, but honestly, all of it could be done telephonically or by audio video conferencing real time. And some of it could be done by a patient portal as well. You talked about um, your telehealth clinic. What does a telehealth clinic look like? And can you talk a little bit about website manner? What should a patient expect um, at their telehealth visit? Yeah, that's a great question. So at the University of Washington, I've actually spent a fair amount of time working on developing nurse practitioners to actually work in this space, this virtual space. And there are four principles that people really should be following when they're in that space. And so some of it is like right now, you can see my face, it's well lit. Um, hopefully I identified myself when I came into the visit. I showed you a name tag to authenticate that I am who I say I am and maybe even demonstrate that I'm part of uh, uh, the health system that you think you're doing business with. Uh, it's very evident that no one else is in earshot or if someone else is in the room, I've introduced them and I've shared with you the relevance of their presence in our visit together that I'm in a private space that nobody can just barge in through the door because if I'm doing an examination on you, you're showing me a rash on your belly, um, that I, I've created a, a private space and a safe space. One of the other things that's sort of in the background is, um, you know, doing business with people who you feel quite confident they're taking every um, a bit of action to protect patient health information and um, that they're on a secure uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, internet connection, for example. But people should be professional and they should be in a location that is professional. So those are sort of the kind of the high level things that you need to be thinking about and, and expectations as a patient that you, that are very realistic. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's fantastic. And it's not something that I, pro I personally probably would have thought about 
if I were doing a telehealth visit to even ask, right, I would just make the assumption and that's probably pretty foolish. So I appreciate um, um, the information on the uh, web website manner. So we've talked a little bit about policies. We've talked a little bit about the different modalities of telehealth, of course, about why we think it's important yesterday, today, and tomorrow to make it even better. How do, um, how do they know if they qualify within their state with whatever health insurance they may or may not have for telehealth? And I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, CCHPCA when you had sent over that link, I was fascinated and thrilled to have the resource. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I would say that health policy as it relates to the provision of telehealth services is always changing state by state. So um, one thing that I didn't kind of make the connection is that laws in your state will also directly influence and mandate what health insurance companies and providers can do or are mandated to do, including reimbursement, for example. So policy at a local and a national level influences that. These benefits by insurance are a moving target. They're always changing. And um, the only way to really know is to actually look at your plan or call your health plan and find out what services they provide, um, because that can change on an annual basis or even more frequently. And right now, there may be many different, um, you know, this is all in flux. And so what is covered today in this period of time may be yet different um, once we get outside of this provisional time uh, that has been set um, at a national level. So the safest thing to do is to just check in with your insurance company frequently and find out what your telehealth you know, benefits are. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Does that help? Yep, that's perfect. What can the average person, you know, regardless of whether they need medical attention right now or not do to help ensure that we don't slip backwards from where sadly it took a crisis to kind of get us at least moving forward in the right direction? Well, I'll tell you what, um, providers and patients' voices um, at a local and national level are very, very moving. Um, lawmakers need to hear about what we need and what our experiences are in, in our communities. And um, Lawmakers not only need to know it, but they want, I, I believe in my heart that they want to know it. Now, um, Danielle, you had referred to this resource that I directed you to, the Center for Connected Health Policy. It is a, a really wonderful resource. It's federally funded. Their, um, their whole mission is to track um, telehealth legislation in every state and at a federal level in this country. So if you want to know what legislation currently exists in your state, um, as it relates to telehealth, you can go there and see that. If you want to know during a legislative session, what telehealth policy has been introduced and currently moving through the, the legislative um, action process, you can also see that. Um, and I would tell people, you know, when your legislative session in your state is about to um, come around the corner, take a look at what legislation has been introduced is, and is going to be coming forward. And you can actually track that at a state level. And as a member of that state, as a resident of that state, you can actually go testify in favor or against legislation that makes sense or doesn't make sense. And, you know, I really encourage people to get involved. Um, there are so many things that we uh, you know, can impact and advocate for. And this is one of them that impacts, you know, the potential for impact is so broad when we can push um, such uh, legislation forward or, or write a letter to your, um, to your legislators and let them know uh, why, why they should support or, um, or deflect certain legislation. Thanks, Joel. Um, just for those of you watching, and, and we'll have information on our website for you, um, the website that Joel was referring to is cchpca.org for those who are interested right now. But again, um, you can come back and get that information uh, on our website at gotofoundation.org. And of course, um, 
We've got um, an amazing, uh, some amazing team members at GoTo who are working on this very thing as well. So, um, and more to come on that. We're, there's so much I think to be said around um, not only telehealth, but um, healthcare in general, particularly from a regulatory standpoint. And um, we want you guys to know all the, the great things us and others are, are, are doing out there uh, to keep that needle moving forward for everyone. Um, so Joelle, I, I wanna make sure um, that in closing, you kind of give us your opinion on why you think telehealth as a whole is an in, important and much needed addition to our healthcare system. You know, in a good way, um, someone had brought up earlier in the question about uh, patient centeredness. And this is something that I actually wrote my whole, um, my whole doctoral project and thesis was addressing health disparities, health inequity um, through a patient centered um, perspective. And what it really boils down to is quality of care and quality of care, like I said earlier, is defined in many different ways, but the patient really should be the center of that quality of care. And we have to meet the patient where they are. And you know, with all the resources in this country, it doesn't make sense to me why we can't find solutions to um, meet the patients. Meanwhile, you know, our healthcare systems and um, have been in a real financial bind, and there's been so much emphasis on transitioning from this fee for service uh, model, where we uh, versus a um, bundled care model, where health healthcare systems get uh, a certain amount of money to take care of their patients, and they have to use that money wisely. And when you consider that, it's like, well, no duh, like. It's, it costs everybody less money in the long run if we actually um, deliver healthcare by telehealth. And, um, and if you really consider it, if you really switched your clinical model, if possible, to telehealth, you know, you could technically have a smaller footprint in your office. You could be paying less rent for the office. You could be paying in some ways uh, less overhead in staff and other resources if we did a lot of this electronically. So to me, it's a no brainer. I think it needs to be patient centered. We tend to forget that that's why we all exist and that is our customer. And if the patient isn't getting what they need, uh, like I said, in an efficient and effective manner, in a timely way, the right care at the right time, then we failed. And, um, and we, we need to continue to push for that. Here, here. I absolutely could not uh, agree with you more. Um, I want to give a big thank you to uh, Joelle for coming out and talking to us. Um, I hope she'll come back again, because like I said, I think there's definitely more to come in this uh, space. So huge, huge thank you, uh, Joelle, for participating. Um, and then I want to jump into some updates. As you guys know, um, weekly, a collaborative um, effort across the lung cancer community is to come up with upda updates um, for our community, particularly how it's pertaining to COVID. So um, in this week's update, um, we answer uh, uh, several important questions. Um, what types of treatments are available for COVID-19? If I sus suspect I have COVID-19, what should I do? If I have COVID-19 and have recovered, am I immune to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus? Can I find out if I was naturally infected to the virus that causes COVID-19 and maybe have developed immunity? And uh, last but not least in this week's update are how can I tell if information I read about COVID-19 is reliable? And I know that's a challenge for a lot of people because there are many, many different avenues um, by which uh, this information around COVID and what it means to you um, can be very, very confusing. So please go to uh, our website again at gotofoundation.org uh, to read more um, about those updates and the, have the answers to those questions. And uh, a final thank you, of course, to all of our supporters, uh, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bowringer, Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Lilly, Merck, Novartis, Oncocyte, Takeda, and Foundation Medicine. Uh, as always, without their support, we would not be able to bring this to you guys. So a huge thank you to them. And um, Joelle, enjoy the rest thank of you. your day. Thank you for, for shuffling your schedule to make yeah. this work for us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye, everybody. Oh, I 
be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see